the Dominican Republic, and our group members are Caleb Godfrey, Anthony Walton, Bennett Ferguson, Aaron Peterson, and Caleb Eddins. The Dominican Republic is located in the Caribbean. It has the Caribbean Sea to the south of it, as well as the Atlantic Ocean to its north. The Dominican Republic is located between Cuba and Puerto Rico, which is also located to the east of Haiti. Haiti occupies about one-thirds of the island to the west, while the Dominican Republic occupies about two-thirds of the island to the east. Um, the Dominican Republic has a land area of around 48,310 kilometers squared. Um, it's very similar to Haiti, but it was more similar to its Latin countries to its south. Um, it was once occupied by Haiti from 1822 to 1844. And then it also had an oppressive dictator of Rafael Trujillo between 1930 to 1961. And then the United States intervened. However, Haiti has always not been as fortunate as the Dominican Republic. Um, so, yep. Yeah. The capital of the Dominican Republic is Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo is also the oldest permanent city established by Europeans in the Western Hemisphere. It is located at the mouth of the Ozama River, and it is also known for the oldest Roman Catholic Archbishop in the Americas. They hold a population of around 10.9 million, which is not very large compared to other countries, but it is somewhat large compared to other South American countries that do not have as high of a population. Um, major cities include Santiago de los Caballeros, which holds a population of 1.3 million. Um, they also have, like we said before, Santo Domingo, and that city alone holds a population of 1.5 million, and Santo Domingo Este, which has a population of 700,000 people. Their government is a democratic republic. They currently have a president, and that is President Luis Rodolfo Abinader, and just like the U.S., their presidents hold four years at a time. And their economy on the Index of Economic Freedom is a 61 out of 100, which is not horrible, but could be better. The Dominican Republic is known for its sightseeing and tourist-attracting environment. Um, there are many things to do in the Dominican Republic that don't revolve around sightseeing, However, me personally, I like to sightsee, and one of them that caught my attention was the Snorkel and Sunset Cruise. Now, this cruise is not like a big luxury cruise that they put you on a cruise boat. This is they put you on a sailboat. They take you out in smaller groups, um, take you out snorkeling, take pictures, get to experience the environment. This will cost you around 116 U.S. dollars, or 6,444 Dominican pesos. Uh, Dominican pesos are worth much less than U.S. dollars. They're worth about .018 U.S. dollars. Um, like I said before, most of the attractions revolve around sightseeing. However, there are many other things to do, such as ATV riding, doom buggy tours, um, different things such as that, bungee jumping. But what draws in the most money for the country would be sightseeing tours, and that is what most businesses set up for tourists. All right, for my portion of the presentation, I was assigned, well, I picked... Uh, Dominican foods, I, th I thought that would be interesting to learn about, so uh, here's my presentation. Alright. Uh, plantains are generally considered the ultimate Dominican food. Um, they are confused with uh, the popular American-like style banana, which is yellow, and a lot like people think monkeys eat it, stuff like that. Uh, but this isn't the case at all. They are a lot thicker and uh, this makes them like chewier to eat and They are way way less sweet sweet like a lot of people will eat it with like ice cream and stuff like people in the Dominican Republic Don't do that uh, Plantains originated from Southeast Asia, but now they grow all over the world like especially in Latin America and and countries that that use this food as a uh, a main dish. Uh, plantains can be eaten raw, fried, boiled, mashed. It, it really doesn't matter how you eat them. They're delicious according to the people that uh, 
were on the website. Um, some popular like dishes that plantains are in are tostones, mango, uh, son chocho de minicona, uh, planto plantonas, uh, manduros fritos, and uh, pasteles en olla. All right. All right. Uh, after doing a lot of research uh, on the most popular foods in the Dominican Republic, uh, and and there were a lot of them, and and all of them did look very appetizing. But these ones that, that I picked looked uh, some like something I would eat if if I traveled to the country. So starting out, uh, pastelitos. Uh, it's a very small version of an empanada. Um, it's an appetizer of sorts. It's uh, like a small stuffed pastry. And uh, the, you can put pretty much whatever you want in it. it, it, it the possibilities are endless. Uh, but the most popular uh, stuffings are usually meat or uh, cheese. And uh, it, it looks great. Uh, the next food is on the list that I have is uh, Sanchocho, and it is a traditional soup dish. Uh, it consists of vegetables like corn, pumpkin, uh, beans, blah, blah, blah. It it's, looks really good. Uh, for meats, uh, you usually serve uh, with like pork or chicken or uh, beef. They're all mixed into the soup. And uh, it's usually served on special occasions like New Year's, but like nowadays with so many people traveling to the country and it being such a popular dish, it's now being served at many restaurants for uh, tourists. Uh, the next dish that I have on here is uh, tostones, uh, also called uh, fritos verdes. And uh, it is one of the most popular side dishes, probably I would say the most popular side dish in the Dominican Republic. It's a deep fried plantain, usually double deep fried, and it is always salted. Uh, They're eaten with almost every meal, like weekly, like, uh, like I mean, lunch, dinner. Uh, you might have it as like a, an appetizer, like a snack sort of thing. I, I would compare it to Americans eating french fries, like uh, that's how popular it is. Uh, the next dish that I have is uh, yaro, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. It has become the newest classic in the Dominican Republic, and uh, it's it's a newcomer because uh, it it is a street food. It uh, consists of a layer of uh, mashed uh, or boiled uh, plantains uh, or french fries. It, it doesn't really matter, but um, it's usually topped with uh, shredded or like minced meat. And it has a lot of uh, different cheeses, like a big variety of cheeses on it. And it, it's usually drizzled uh, with like mayo or, or ketchup. Uh, it is, was created, this dish specifically was created in uh, Santiago uh, by food trucks. And uh, food trucks are exploding in popularity around the world. It's, it's not just in the Dominican Republic. Like, uh, for example, America, food trucks are becoming extremely popular. Uh, the next dish that I have on uh, the list is uh, chen chen. Uh, this is a corn dish, and apparently it's an excellent substitute for rice. Uh, it's a very popular in the southwest regions of the Dominican Republic. Uh, it's made with beans, meat, and uh, mashed plantains. Uh, again, showing that plantains are used in uh, almost every dish in uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, chen chen is considered... Uh, or not considered, but is uh, said to have a risotto-like texture, uh, depending on, on who cooks it. But the website that I, I found it on said that it, it tasted very, or not tasted, but um, had a similar texture to risotto. Uh, it is often made with like coconut milk. That's that also goes in there, and it, it pairs great with uh, meat dishes, uh, particularly uh, goat meat and uh, beef like shredded beef and uh, the last on the list and this one looked amazing to me and I'd love to try it especially with how popular it seems to be in the Dominican Republic and that is la bandera dominicana 
Uh, this dish is considered something close to the national lunchtime dish. Like, like almost everybody eats it for lunch. Like how Americans would eat sandwiches. Uh, most people in the Dominican Republic would eat this. So the three different kinds of food on the plate represent the colors of the Dominican flag, which is uh, red, white, and blue, similar to America. Uh, the beans representing the red, uh, the white representing the rice, and uh, the blue representing the meat portion of uh, the dish. Uh, this dish is uh, usually served with uh, avocado or like a side salad. And uh, it looked like, from many websites that I found, is that it was accompanied by tostones, the deep fried plantains. So I think that would be one amazing meal to have. So these were the most popular dishes that I could find uh, that looked the most appetizing to me. And uh, one day, I hope I get to try them. Hi there, uh, I'm Bennett Ferguson, and um, today I'm doing my presentation on the holidays of the Dominican Republic. Um, forgive some of the background noise, I've got some, some cats running around here who might be making a little bit of a mess. Um, so the Dominican Republic has a lot of unique holidays that uh, mainly follow a very religious Christian um, belief. And so a lot of these holidays are, are centered around what was happening um, in, in, in Christianity at the time when they were created. So at the beginning of the calendar year, we start off with New Year's Day, uh, which is pretty much just like our, 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 our New Year's Day. We celebrate the, the start of the new year, reigning it in. They follow kind of the same calendar that we do. I mean, exactly the same calendar that we do. Um, and that's not where the similar, similarities stop. Um, so we'll get into that as we go further. But then uh, six days later, um, from, from January 1st, we go to the Day of the Kings. Day of the Kings is uh, a religious holiday, a Christian religious holiday, that, uh, that goes back from the previous year. So um, if the birth of Christ was December 25th, which, you know, uh, Christmas is, 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 was created for, was, was to celebrate the birth of Jesus, um, then uh, they believe that it took the the wise men, the magi, whatever you want to call um, the three the three kings, as they're also referred to as. Uh, it took them until January sixth to get to um, where Jesus was being kept in the stable in Bethlehem, and so uh, it's a feast commemorating the journey that the that the wise men took to get there. Um, next up, we have uh, Our Lady of High Grace, uh, which is another feast. Um, that take that centers around another Christian holiday. Uh, there's a theme going on here: Christian holidays, a feast, um, and it's it's all about the the Lady of High Grace. Then we go to Duarte's birthday. Duarte's birthday is the first non-Christian holiday that they celebrate in the in the year that's nationally recognized throughout the Dominican Republic, and that is the celebration of um, uh, Juan Pablo Duarte, his birthday. Uh, he was a military leader for the for Dominica, for the Dominican Republic, um, and he uh, had many military victories. He got them to where they are today. He's a nationally recognized hero throughout Dominica, throughout the Republic. Um, then we move to Holy Week. Holy Week can take place uh, in a number of weeks through March and April, and it is basically um, Palm Sunday. It is the celebration of Jesus entering uh, on his donkey um, and uh, with his wise men, uh, and it's, it's nationally, it's, it's a nationally recognized holiday because most of the population, uh, is, is very Christian. Then Mother's Day happens when it happens. Father's Day also happens, uh, around the same time it happens in the United States. Same thing kind of as, as ours. I'm sure gifts are different, um, and probably the food's different, but it's sort of the same gist. Then we move to August 16th which is Restoration Day. Restoration Day is the day that the Dominican Republic fought and won their sovereignty as a nation um, through all of these, uh, through, through the battle, the Restoration War um, that took place. And so there's a long history of battle in, in the Dominican Republic, and Restoration Day falls on the day that they won. 
and they were able to get their 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 sovereignty become the nation that they are uh, and so they celebrate that every august 16th moving down to um to september 24th we have our lady of mercy which is another feast they like to have feasts our lady of mercy it was called our lady of ransom for a while but the church changed that uh, to Our Lady of Mercy. It has a nicer ring to it, I believe, than Our Lady of Ransom. Uh, it's another feast commemorating um, Christianity, their beliefs. Uh, it's time to be with people you love, time to be with family. It's very unique. Then we go to November 6th, and that is the day that they, they officially signed their constitution to become a country. Um, they This is the constitution they still use today. Um, and you know, it took a while from August 16th to November 6th to hash it out, to figure out what the country was going to be. Um, then they, they figured it out. Moving on, the final, the final holiday that they have in the calendar year that's nationally recognized is Christmas. Uh, December 25th, same as, same as uh, the United States, same as most of the known world that celebrates Christmas. Um, they celebrate it. Different ways they do have candy canes, Christmas trees, all of that unique, cool stuff. But um, this country is very heavily Christian, and a lot of their holidays are such. Thank you. I did my famous person biography on Vladimir Guerrero or Vlad the Impaler. He was a major league baseball player who played for the Montreal Expos, the LA Angels, the Texas Rangers, and the Baltimore Orioles. He was born on February 9th, 1975 in Nazeo, Dominican Republic, which is also where his family grew up and his parents were based, I guess you could say. Um, he played for 16 total seasons in the MLB from 1996 to 2011, where he retired in 2011 and stopped playing baseball. But in 2014, he would come back to sign a one-year or a one-day contract to retire officially from baseball. Some stuff about Guerrero's early life. He was one of nine siblings in his family from his parents, Damien and Alta Gracia Guerrero, which his older brother, Wilton Guerrero, grew, or um, was playing the MLB for the Expos. Um, Throughout Guerrero's life, he had five siblings go through the MLB and the minor leagues, which is insane because that's an incredible sports accomplishment to even get to the minor leagues, more or less the MLB. That's just like you have to be insanely athletic for five of your siblings to go. Um, so he grew up in an insanely athletic family. Um, Vlad, a fun fact about Vlad, he grew up, for 15 years of his life without even owning a baseball glove, which the only way he was ever able to even get a baseball glove was from his older brother who was already in the minor leagues, which is insane for him to be known as one of the greats of baseball and to not even start truly playing baseball until he was 15 years old. It just, that just means he had a lot of hard work and dedication, which Honestly, everybody should kind of appreciate him for. And another thing about Guerrero's early career, his teenage years, kind of, um, he grew up um, practicing a lot and training in the Dodgers training complex in the Dominican Republic, which his brother, Wilton Guerrero, actually played for the Dodgers. But through that eight months, the Dodgers never offered him a contract. So they sent him home. But a scout for the Montreal Expos ended up offering Guerrero a $2,100 or $2,100 contract on in March 1993, which is what started Guerrero's major league career. Um, throughout Vladimir's career, he played for the Montreal Expos for eight seasons. Then he played for the Anaheim Angels, who ended up turning into the Los Angeles Angels for a total of six seasons. And um, we got, he played for the Texas Rangers for a total of one season and the Baltimore Orioles for a total of one season, which is when he retired. But on the side here, I have 
some pictures of the logos of the different teams he played for from start to finish from the Montreal Expos up here, the Anaheim Angels, the Los Angeles Angels, which you can see the translation, how they ended up, the Anaheim Angels just moved to Los Angeles and became Los Angeles Angels. And then we have the Texas Rangers and the Orioles. Um, some of some of Vladimir's very many accomplishments was that he was inducted in the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2018 with almost a unanimous vote. It was like they he deserved to be in the Hall of Fame for how great his career was. He was the Eastern League Rookie of the Year. Um, he was also the Eastern League MVP that exact same year in 1996. Um, he was the American League MVP in 2004. He was, or he was awarded the Outstanding Designated Hitter, or the DH Award, in 2010. He was a nine-time MLB All-Star from those years, from 99 pretty much all the way to 2010, skipping years like 2003 and 2008 and 2009. But then he was awarded the eight-time Silver Slugger winner, from 99 pretty much to 2010, same years pretty much, other than skipping 2001 and then 2008, 2009, just like with the MLB All-Star. He was also the two-time Montreal Expos minor league player of the year in 95 and 96, which is also the year he won the Eastern League MVP and the Eastern League Rookie of the Year. He was also a four times LA Angels player of the year from 2004 to 2007. And then that's not even accompanying his minor league and double A awards that he received way earlier on in his career from like that 94 to 95 span. Um, this is just a slide about his retirement. Um, Vlad came back to the MLB on March 31st, 2014, and signed a one-day contract with the Los Angeles Angels and retired from baseball completely. I think this shows a lot about him loving the, organi the organization of the Angels because he didn't have to do that. He could have retired with the Baltimore Orioles and just left it there, but he wanted to show his gratitude to this organization which he only played for for six years moving from Anaheim to Los Angeles and I think that shows a lot about Vlad's character and I think it's very interesting but going back going back to this slide I wanted to hit back on this um, this picture on the right this is Vladimir Guerrero in a Montreal's Expo jersey mid-game and then this is his brother, Wilton Guerrero, in a Dodgers jersey whenever he was in the career, or whenever he was in his career, which was his older brother, which I find that very interesting because, like, playing in the MLB with your brother, like, alongside with your brother is insane, to be honest. Like, it's a dream come true. But that's all.